Good afternoon and welcome to our live safari on this windy afternoon with the clouds of the last part of this cold front rolling across the sky. A cold front that brought us an unexpected downpour first thing in the, this morning. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Jamie and this afternoon I have Vim on camera with me. Brent is out with Dave searching for the wonderful and mystical things that there are to show you about the African bush. And Steph and Jandre will also be out on bushwalk. We have the lovely Rebecca and Lou in final control. And together as a team, we bring you a live safari here from the hot. in the Sabi Sands which all falls under the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. And right here we start off our safari in the great open area right next to the camps where we are fortunate enough to live and enjoy the wonders of this magical area. Now, not only are we here and bringing you a live safari but we are also interactive which means that you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv and please do because we do love to hear from you and we're keen to get your questions and comments rolling it's like having you on the back of the vehicle here with us and with no further ado let us carry on and see what wonders we can find I've just spoken to a fan who works as a tracker at the lodge, Vuyatela and Galago on Juma, and he tells me that he saw lion tracks this morning going into the block where they've been evading us in for the last few days. So we'll be heading through in that direction, I think. What do you think, Viam? Should we go find some lions? Yes. Yeah, I think so. I know that Brent has rushed off south to see whether or not the Queen of Juma, Karula the Leopard, and we're sort of in the center of her territory. And this morning, she was there drinking from a puddle of the road, only to cross south of our boundary to an area where we couldn't follow her. But fingers crossed, she will be back with us at some point this afternoon. Oh, no, this hat doesn't, doesn't even want to stay on my head as we drive along through quarantine. You can probably hear the wind is howling and it is really quite chilly. You can see wrapped up in my jacket and it is around 17 degrees, which is 63 in Fahrenheit. With no further ado, Brent has found the first wonder of the afternoon. So let's head across to him. Welcome to Safari Live and look at this. We're with this beautiful young elephant bull and he's slowly been moving his way towards us and look at that isn't that exquisite he's probably 30 ish so not quite at full size yet but a nice big boy nonetheless see really tall at the shoulder up to about, probably about three and a half meters hello big boy let's see if we can get a little bit closer right on the southern edge of our traverse and there are tracks of a breeding herd heading south so I think you can see him sniffing there smelling where the other elephants might be now we're looking very carefully at his behavior I just decided to go the other way now see how his trunk is on the ground to sniff out the ladies. Let's go see what he's up to. So he's definitely on the trail of a breeding herd, but welcome to Safari Live. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Dangerous Dave on camera, and we're with this magnificent elephant bull. Amazing how these big animals can move so quietly through the bush. There he is, 
head in a knob thorn thicket, probably found a nice little snack there. They able to eat an incredible amount of vegetation in a day. Now you can probably eat close on 500 pounds of vegetable matter in a day and drink 20 gallons of water. It's not uncommon to find an elephant bull on his own. They do spend quite a bit of time away from the big breeding herds. Notice how his trunk is just swaying from side to side along the ground. He's definitely sniffing out where the rest of the elephants have gone. Now he's about to go into a little river system that's going to be a bit precarious for us to follow. We will try to stay with him for a bit longer before he gets there, but then we'll leave him to see what he's sniffing. We might just loop up ahead and we might catch up with the breeding herd. In weather like we're having today, it's, it's, it's not warm, even though the sun's out, it's only 17 degrees Celsius. Brrr. And let's see where he's going. Now, with elephants, you have to be very careful in this weather. Specifically around the breeding herds, it's not such a problem with the big boys. The reason for this is they can be a little bit nervous with this gusting wind, especially if they've got young babies. So if we do find the breeding herd, it's always good to stay, stop initially quite far away, and gauge their, engage their behavior before we start going closer. There you go, he's gonna disappear. can just see him disappearing. So, hi Tim in Arkansas. Now, Tim is having a very special drive. He's got his grandson Brandon with him. Hi Brandon, lovely to have you on drive with us. And Brandon wanted to see an Ellie. So what a good start to the drive for Tim and Brandon. Glad you guys are with us. Hope you're enjoying. We're gonna leave that Ellie. He's going into some really thick stuff now. And as I said, gusting wind. Uh, we've got to be a little bit careful with eddies in this weather. Okay, so our plan is we didn't get down to Cheetah Plain this morning, but we did find Queen Karula. And uh, for those of you not sure who Queen Karula is, Queen Karula is the dominant, dominant female leopard on a Juma. And we had a brief visual of her as she scooted off down south out of our Travis area unfortunately so I'm hoping we'll be able to find some cats down on Cheetah Plains we've just done a check for Karula's tracks now and they haven't come back to the north so unfortunately she's still down south but she was looking quite hungry and this windy weather might have her on the move and on the hunt so we'll definitely look there later on this evening Eddie's heading up the opposite side of this little river system. So I'm just having a, a quick look to see if there's any other elephants that he might be tracking. Sarah Shark would like to know how much water can an elephant get into its trunk. I said in a day a big bull like that can drink about 20 gallons. Now I'm just under 2 gallons, about 8 litres it can fit in its trunk. An incredible amount. And, uh, and they can spray it, they can suck it. It's an incredible appendage in an elephant's trunk. Uh, depending on how you define muscles, there's over a hundred thousand muscles in this trunk alone. And there's a chili, chili impala all puffed up in the cold wind. Now, they're not gonna be too happy with this weather. And you, we're gonna find that a lot of our sort of general game, uh, so talking about the herbivore species, are gonna be a bit nervous in this wind. 
course, with this wind, they do lose their hearing. And with wind gusting like it is today, their sense of smell is also affected. So sometimes you'll notice that they're not going to hang around for us like they normally do. So I've stopped quite far from this guy. And you can see he's also getting a nice little afternoon sunbathe. There were some more impala in the bush, so he's not alone. Yes, mister, I'm talking about you. Right, we're going to leave him to bathe in the afternoon sunlight. I'm a little bit jealous, although we did have some nice sun on our back, but here comes this cloud again. And it's chilly again. Tony in Pennsylvania, cold part of the world. That Tony's saying it seems like all the seasons in Pennsylvania are a month late uh, this year. Is it the same here? I wouldn't say quite the same. I mean, it's very unusual to have rain like we did this morning during the dry season. But I would say probably on average every dry season it rains two or three times when it's not supposed to. But I would say this weather is slightly unusual normally. In winter, we don't have any of these cumulus clouds around. Uh, we've only got sort of stratus, sort of stratus, very really high icicles and uh, normally clear, clear skies. It's a little bit unusual, uh, but I would say we're pretty much on par with where things should be. We did have a very dry, wet season and we are in the throes of a drought. Uh, but drought is natural and it, and it works in cycles. We have had a very wet eight years preceding this year. So, not uncommon to have a very dry year after an end of about an eight year wet cycle. But it's always great to be out in the bush and we never know what we're going to find or what we're going to see. So that's what makes it really exciting. And if you want to know anything, you might have heard people asking questions and you can also ask me a question very simply you just pop an email to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safari live on twitter and hopefully between jamie myself and steph we'll be able to answer any questions to go down into a, into a dip here and we might get a little bit of signal breakup. It's one of those weird ones that sometimes it's perfect, sometimes not. No, I don't know how all that stuff works. I'll just concentrate on the animals. Oh well, Brent goes through something of a signal dip. I'm sure that he's been chatting a little bit about this ominous, I can say it today, this ominous weather that is sort of swirling around us. We're driving straight into the wind, so it's coming from the southeast. And I don't know that the rain is quite over just yet. I can't quite decide if this is the end of the cold front or if there's more on its way towards us. And of course, we're grateful for every drop of rain that we receive. We have, I don't think this morning was terribly much. It was a very short cloud burst. But I think we might be seeing some more before the day is out. Hopefully it can hold, up, hold off towards or hold off until the end of the sunset safari where we are perfectly capable of driving about in a light drizzle. What it does mean though is that the animal life of the Sabi sands is trying to hide away. 
most of the impala, the zebra, I know that you saw an impala and an elephant with Brent, but a lot of the stuff is hiding away and most of the time they will be ducked down in the bushes trying to stay sheltered. Wow, it almost feels like we're going to have a storm actually, which is truly bizarre at this time of year. Now when I woke up before, just before it got light and when Brent was heading out on the sunrise safari, could hear it bucketing down, which was the last thing I expected to, to hear. And we'll see. You have to look especially hard for the animals at the moment. And the birds struggle as well. It's very difficult flying weather, especially because the wind is swirling. It hasn't picked one general direction and is just blowing in that. It's swirling all around us making the marula trees creak ominously. And that's also very interesting. Sorry, I'm gonna go backwards so that we can sort of see it in the light. Because it looks as though this marula tree is getting new leaves. And that, that is really quite bizarre. I know we can't see it all that clearly, but look at that. That looks like fresh growth. That's not old leaves that haven't yet fallen off. There's fresh green growth coming from the tops of this marula tree. Those look like they, that might be older growth that hasn't yet fallen off in the autumn, in the autumn winds. But marula trees are deciduous, which means they do lose their, lose their leaves. And really, it's only in the start of our, or at the start of our spring that we should be seeing new growth. I wonder if this rain hasn't confused them. Very interesting things happening with our seasons. Well, there you go. I'll keep an eye on that, see if there's any more fresh green growth from any of the other marula trees. Very, very interesting stuff. So we'll see what kind of effect the drought has on our area. Our marula trees, one of my absolute favorite trees just because of their incredible cultural significance but mostly because of the fruit that they produce and the delicious sweet tasting and high vitamin C content of those fruits I'm not alone in that the elephants love them as well uh, Kim Kim you were wondering about whether or not we get tornadoes out here in the African bush the answer is no, we don't. I, I'm aware that there was a, a terrible series of tornadoes very recently. We are fortunate enough out here that we do not get them. We do get, we can get very high winds, but we are sheltered by a range of mountains known as the Drakensberg Mountains. And they actually keep us from the worst of the weather. And we're far enough away from the coast that hurricanes are not a problem either. And there we go, we have some animals for you. Here we go. This is where all of the animals have been hiding, or at least a great deal of the zebra. Quite a few of them lying down, particularly the younger members of this herd just trying to make their surface area a little bit smaller so that they are not quite faced with the full, <laughs> the full effect of the wind. I'm sorry, I tried to put my elbow to rest it on the box and watch the monitor and I slipped off and nearly bashed my nose on the gear stick. We're starting off well. This is the same herd, I would suspect that we've been seeing recently around the Juma Dam camera. And then we've also got a very familiar sight in this area, the male wildebeest that hangs out around Impala Plains. This is the place that he calls home in his territory. A nice thing for them, I suppose, in being out in the clearings is that whilst it is a little bit more exposed, it does mean that they don't have to worry as much about predators sneaking up on them. 
And on a day like today, with the wind howling, that is a distinct possibility. It's also cool enough that all of the big cats will be happy to wander, walk about, even the lions. So they need, have their work cut out for them in terms of staying alert. Also means that every bush is rustling, they can't rely on their hearing, and in response they're on high alert. You just look at this female. While her foal suckles, she's constantly looking out for any sign of danger. And hello to Finn, who is eight years old, and welcome. I hope you're enjoying seeing all of the magical creatures out here in Africa. Now, Finn, you were wondering, why are the animals afraid of the rain? Well, Finn, it's not so much the rain as the wind that is howling, because an animal like a zebra, like the zebra that we've been looking at, they can't see all that well. So they have to rely on their sense of smell and their hearing. And when the wind blows, there's a lot of noise. All of the leaves are rustling, all of the grass is rustling, and they can't hear if a predator like a leopard or a lion is sneaking up on them. That and also Finn, just like us, they get cold. So that's why these zebra are lying down there. They're trying to stay sheltered from the wind that's blowing. They found some nice trees to hide behind. And they want to just try and keep their heads down. This is serious predator hunting weather. This is also for us as people working in the bush or as, as guides working in the bush, this is the really scary tracking weather. Not even that half light of the morning or the half light of the evening. And this kind of afternoon is the scariest weather to walk in the bush. And that's when you really start to understand and empathize with the animals that live here from day to day. Because you go walking through in thick vegetation and everything's rustling around you, you know that there are nervous buffalo somewhere around you, there are nervous animals everywhere around you. And it does become an interesting exercise in just walking incredibly slowly. And you'll find that with all of us, Whenever we all go off tracking in this kind of weather, we creep forward, meter by meter, very, very slowly. Very often from big tree to big tree to big tree to big tree. Now I empathize with our zebra herd standing out here. And looking for different things, nonetheless, Jesse, you were wondering about whether or not the rain makes it more difficult to see tracks or to follow tracks. Um, it depends on the amount of rain that we get. Usually the general rule is that rain makes it harder, it washes away the tracks and it makes the soil quite hard, which means that a light-footed animal, like a leopard, barely leaves any tracks. But if you were tracking, if, for example, you wanted to track the zebra, you'd find it relatively easy. The ground slightly soft, they're heavy animals and their hooves are very sharp. So they'd leave clear, clear Im imprints on the soil wherever they go. Little one searching for comfort from mom at the back there. Not enjoying this. You can see by the movements of the trees around the zebra how windy it really is. Yesterday evening when we finished off our sunset safari there was zebra yip 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 calling from Treehouse Dam. We never did figure out what had upset them to this degree but we did mention that there are quite a few zebra around and quite possibly actually several herds and definitely at least one bachelor herd of zebra within the group. And it could well be that that amount of noise came from disruption from a group of males. Oh wow, just look at this weather. There are rays of sun trying to peek through every now and again. Oh, Woiti? I've said that this is this, the place that we generally find 
our wildebeest male that is staring off reflectively into the distance. You're wondering, are wildebeest territorial? And if so, why do we get those huge herds and those great migratory patterns as we do in Eastern Africa? Wildebeest are, my, uh, are territorial, wildebeest males at least. It is, however, area dependent when they are territorial. So for us here in the Sabi Sands, with the level of resources that we have, wildebeest are territorial all year round. They, male wildebeest that is, they will try and protect an area. The better the area is with grass and with water access, the more sort of competition there is and the smaller the male wildebeest territories tend to be. But then the further onto the outskirts you get, like with this gentleman, a bit, bit too far away from a good water source. Good grazing, nice open patch, so he's still got that going for him. But his territory might be a bit larger. And that way, by, by picking the best area, they hope to attract the most females. If you go up to Eastern Africa, if you go towards Tanzania and the Maasai Mara, Kenya, those sorts of areas, wildebeest put aside their territorial nature to form together in those groups, in those herds, just in the same way stallions, zebra stallions, will group together to create much larger herds. But wildebeest in particular, they'll group together in large numbers, migrate because there's safety in numbers and that's their instinct, and then once they get to the, the area where they want to establish themselves, then they will split off again and start to form territories. So for us, wildebeest are permanently territorial, towards other or in other places in Africa, wildebeest have a slightly different, more temporal approach to territories and they'll move off on their own. And speaking of migrating, I think that we're going to plan on migrating across towards Arethusa. See if we can't pick up on anything happening there. Look at that sky. Well, we are driving off into the west. I think Brent is heading towards Cheetah Plains. Uh, there's a good chance he might be able to update you more at some point about what's happening with those cheetah that we saw on yesterday afternoon's sunset safari. It was very entertaining watching them slowly inch their way north from Mala Mala. When we first saw them, it felt as though they were the equivalent distance of from here to Cape Town. It's a slight exaggeration. They were about seven, maybe a kilometer away, if I'm completely honest. But they were slowly moving north when we left them. Uh, hopefully they decide, they have decided to head across in that direction. <coughs> across the bumpy roads. The other interesting thing about heading out after weather like we have had, just to go back to that question about tracking, is if it is a light rain, then it does, it actually can help you. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. That's because in a light rain, the tracks are not necessarily washed away. And if they are fresh tracks and the soil hasn't been hardened to the point that they don't show up, then you'll be able to see them clearly, but you'll also be really accurately able to age them. I feel as though I need to duck down into the steering wheel and power forward. This wind is so strong. Just need to get off the open road. Nearly there. Sure. Let's just zoom through here. There is somebody waiting behind us on this main access road. Ah! I've got cold, so I've had to layer up. We're driving through the now dry three in a row pan area. We saw tracks of a male leopard, but they were underneath the rain. So, too old to really follow on. So, what we're doing now is we're just scooting through the area, trying to find tracks that might be a bit more fresh. But with the wind today, Oh, the sun's lovely. Uh, with the wind today, it'll make that a little bit more difficult. But 
this light is gorgeous. Quite bright all of a sudden. I'll take my warm hat off and put my cap back on for now. So, one of the wonderful things about Safari Live in the last while is it's been growing. So we've got quite a few new viewers. So, guys, if you are new to Safari Live, and you'd like to ask, uh, ask me some questions about myself, where I'm from, what I've done in the bush before Safari Live uh, on this windy, cold afternoon. Now's your chance. Uh, if you want to ask me a bit about myself, uh, send through the questions to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And hopefully I'll be able to take some of those questions from some new viewers who, who might want to know a little bit more about some of the presenting team. Hello, Molly. Molly is nine years old. Welcome on the drive, Molly. Molly would like to know, have I ever been charged by an animal while in the vehicle? I have Molly a few times. I've been charged by elephant, buffalo, a couple of times by lion, uh, but most of those charges are warning charges. And normally if you shout or clap, bang the side of the car, you can stop them. So I've never actually been hit in the car. And most animals, if they are charging you, they're not really trying to attack you. What they're doing is saying, you're too close, please go away. Well, not please go away, they say it in a little bit more of a, a nasty fashion. So we've got a good chance for a few different leopards in this area, as well as, of course, cheetah. So the leopards we look for around here is the quarantine young male. So our old viewers, or our regular viewers, will know him really well. Um, he was one of Karula, in Karula's last successful litter. And he's a wonderful leopard, really entertaining to spend time with. Another will be one of his half-brothers, who's quite a bit older and sort of trying to set up territory in this area. And his name is Shivambalan. Also, as I said, Karula's, uh, one of Karula's offspring. And Karula's the dominant female on Juma. We're quite far east now. And then there's Nkanyenini, who's a female leopard, uh, who's got two cubs. Uh, so those are the sort of four main leopards. There's always a chance we could see uh, the unnamed female cub of Tandi, uh, which is another female leopard who's dominant around Tortured Chitwa in the west of the reserve. Lions here, there's always a possibility we could get new lions in from Kruger. The Kruger National Park boundary is just here, but generally in the west it'll be the sticks, uh, and they might come through all the way to this area, but also then the Birmingham boys. Uh, the coalition of four males now, there were five, one died recently, uh, and this is part of their territory as well. Very, very occasionally the Nkuma pride might meander this far, but it is less likely to have the Nkumas down here. What do we have it there? Nothing, the dirt playing tricks on my eyes. So this road is called Owl's Nest. So I assume many moons ago when they were making the roads in this area and uh, made this road, there was obviously a visible owl's nest. I've asked Ephraim and them and they say, well, there's no more owl's nest on the road. So hopefully, we can find a new owl's nest and owl's nest. I have seen a Varose eagle owl fly across here once before. Andreen's wondering, how much of a temperature difference is there between Cheetah Plains and Juma? Uh, because it's more open. Andrine, uh, negligible. There's very, very little temperature difference. Uh, we might feel a bit colder out on the plains once we get there because 
there's nothing to break up the wind, is it? Mm. Buffets towards us, but uh, I would say the temperature difference is, is very negligible. Um, nothing that we could really definitely notice. The one place you can notice the temperature difference is the bottom of the little river systems, especially in the early morning and, and, and after dark. Very noticeable temperature difference there. It's always nice as you come up the hill and get back into the warm air. We're about to arrive. Yeah. I don't see it. Right on top of this. There we go. Oh, there we went. I need to go forward a bit. Okay. A little bit lower. There we go. A little bit up. You flew up. There we go. Just to the There we go. White helmet shrike, such pretty birds. Oof, off they go in a hurry. It's going to be difficult to see birds in this wind. They're, they are a little bit skittish. And uh, that was a little white helmet shrike. A beautiful little bird. Uh, insectivores, and they love a good caterpillar. And they are sometimes called the Seven Sisters. They're often found in flocks of seven, uh, but anything from five to twelve is, is, is normal. But it's very strange how very often there are exactly seven of them. Here we go, we're about to come out to the cheetah's Plains pad. Well, on the subject of birds, a very warm welcome to a cold sunset safari. Francie from Oregon, all oh, elephants, uh, would like to know. We'll get to the Ellie now. Um, or oh, Francie, I'll come back to your question. Let's have a look at this Ellie. Another bull. Oh. Obviously, just come out of the Kruger. I mean, we're quite far away from him, so he's just from his behaviour, you can see he's not used to cars. Plus, add this wind in, and he's not a happy camper. It's okay, big boy. So what happened is I don't think he heard us coming because of the wind, and that would have given him a bit of a fright. It's okay, big boy. Now, this is very typical elephant behavior. So he's sort of walking closer to us while holding his head high to be very impressive, but he's also putting a bit more distance. So he's working an oblique angle from us. So he's saying, I'm not actually scared of you, you should be scared of me. But we're definitely not gonna follow him. You can see he's uncomfortable. You can see that, that little stiffness in the tail, how high he's holding his head. It could very much be a, a bull who's come out of Kruger uh, and is not used to game drive vehicles and people yet. There we go. It's okay, big boy. See, now he's put a bit more distance between us and he's, uh, he's feeling a little bit more comfortable. The tail's not quite as rigid. But shame. We're going to leave him be, uh, not wanting to disturb him. I'm just going to call him on, on the radio. So what we have on the radio is here, we have different channels that we speak to when we're in different areas. So it's very important, uh, the use of the radio. We all work as a team to try and find animals. So. We communicate where tracks are, um, where animals are, so I'm just going to let someone know that there's or Andrew and Ephraim who, who drive out here, who is a, uh, well they, they drive out of Cheetah Plains Lodge, so it's very important.
Oh, well, they <laughs> talking a lot, so we'll leave it be for now. Um, and Francie was wondering, do we ever have, do we have any birds that return to the nest, same nests year after year? Yes, we do, Francie. We've got uh, quite a few, quite a lot of the eagles, uh, vultures, swallows, um, woodpeckers, hornbills. So there are a lot of birds that will utilize the same nest year after year, uh, particularly if it's in a really good spot. One Madonna and Lob, she's a plant fan. So that Ellie wasn't too relaxed, so we let him be. So it sounds like Jamie might have found some that are a bit more forthcoming. Our elephant seems to be relatively content to sit next to the car or stand next to the car and feed with us relatively peacefully. Now, it is very windy this afternoon as we discussed which does occasionally have the tendency to upset elephants slightly but he is more than happy. He's found a some delicious plant Looks like a bush willow that he's about to head to. Oh, no, he's going to pop his head straight into a bush. Next to him somewhere, I can hear it chattering away, is a fork-tailed drongo. A little blackbird. Oh, I don't know if you were quick enough there to see it fluttering past. You've got to keep your eyes peeled out here. Things happen quickly. There he is. Well done, Viam. And that little fork-tailed drongo, as he sits and sings away in merriment, is taking advantage of the elephant's presence here. Every time the Ellie moves or tries to feed, he disturbs, or there's the possibility of him disturbing insects. Fork-tailed drongos have learnt that accompanying big animals like this elephant bull is a good way to be assured of a snack. And it's not just elephants that they will do that to. If you head out and you do bush clearing or road clearing, for example, and this is speaking from personal experience, fork-tailed drongos will come and find you and hover about being brave enough to fly right next to your legs in order to take advantage of any insects that you may disturb. Now, he really has thoroughly put himself in an awkward position, our elephant that is, not the fork-tailed drongo. All that's visible of him at the moment is just his bottom. We need to get him some anti-wrinkle cream. Definitely could use it. Let's see if he will let us get a bit of a better view of him. Oh, we're just gonna sidle forward. He seems perfectly comfortable with us and perfectly at peace. Hello boy, aren't you gorgeous? Hmm? Ellie's are very good at letting you know when they're not happy. And so far he's given us every sign that he is perfectly at peace. Oh, face full of bush willow there. He might be perfectly comfortable with us, but he definitely isn't terribly considerate about camera angles. As well he shouldn't be, of course. And there's something very attractive, right in the centre of that patch of trees. Now this elephant bull is probably about, I would guess at, he's less than 10 metres, okay let's call it 10 metres, let's call him 30 feet away from us. And all that's visible is just patches of grey in amongst the bright green leaves of the bush willows that he's munching on. Oh, and those, those big tusks. This is a young Ellie bull, and he's got a fair set of tusks on him already. And he could be a gentleman to watch for in the future as he grows older and those tusks continue to grow. He could well end up being a very, very large tusker. <laughs> 
but just the stump of his tail visible. Hey, boy, you put yourself in a very inconvenient tree. Sometimes it's just really nice to sit and listen to the sound of an elephant feeding next to you. ripping and tearing <laughs> and of course the general products of the gaseous exchange that is happening in his digestive tract. Now he has presented us with a little bit of an opening so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up and go forward once again. Well there's the smell of elephant washing over us. Beautiful I think it's a beautiful smell. Okay, let's go forward ever so carefully. Hey boy, there you go, that's considerate of you, yes, that's the branch you want. Watching him use his tusks and his trunk in tandem. He's picked a really awkward branch there. Oh, and he's even flicked some of us, some of it into my face somehow. I don't quite know how he managed that. That incredible trunk that Brent was talking about earlier with his first Ellie bull working in tandem with his lips and his trunk and his tusks to pull apart and decimate the bush willow. And he's doing what elephants have done from have done for tens of thousands of years. Steve in Montana, you were wondering, do elephants eat the leaves and the wood and how on earth do they digest it all? And the answer is, yes, they will eat the wood and the leaves of the smaller trees, of the smaller branches that they put in their mouth. Otherwise, for the larger branches, they actually only really eat the bark layer, that cambium layer. But for an acacia like the one he's found, oh, no, he's rejected that one. Moving on to the next one, they, the smaller trees go in wood, and cambium, leaves, everything is on the elephant's menu. In terms of how they digest it, well, the answer is with a very sophisticated system of bacterias within their small intestine, different bacterium, bacteria is not the correct plural, but several different bacteria. Oh, there he goes, mouthful of leaves on cue. Onto the silver cluster leaf, is he going to stop there? Yes. Uh, the bacteria help an elephant and a zebra and warthog break pretty much everything down, but nonetheless it is a very ineffective digestive system. So Steve, you are right in the sense that an eddy bull like this one, never mind, Brent has got something exciting, we'll be back with that answer later. A pangolin, it's a pangolin! The first pangolin ever on Safari Live! And it's just crossed the road into Kruger. We're going to try and get a bit of view. Isn't that incredible? Joking. Look at that, a pangolin. Isn't this exciting? He's just laid down. This is my first pangolin in the northern Sabi Sands. Look at him. Look at those armor plates. Now, if you get your finger stuck in there, it can actually cut you. Look at him. So, these short grass areas are home to the pugnacious ant. And 98% of a pangolin's diet 
is a pugnacious act. Dave, well spotted. <laughs> Thanks, friend. Dave, oh my, what the hell is that? It's a pangolin! So because of this cold, windy weather, it might drive a lot of the other animals away, but it's brought the pangolin out early. And I think he's hungry and looking for ants. So this dry season is going to, I really think, produce some amazing sightings of little critters we don't normally see. The African wildcat, serval, maybe even a caracal. But for me, I'm ecstatic. Um, I think there's a, a, a guide from one of the lodges who used to be a long time viewer who challenged me to be the first to find a pangolin. So I think I might want to call her on the radio just now, but not just yet. But I am going to have to let Ephraim and Andrew know if they're close by. Yeah, he's keeping still now. Just roll back, he might. He's still moving. I think he's looking for ants. Look how he's lifting his tail. Might be looking for a spot to snooze in as well. Sorry guys, I got a little bit overexcited there. I don't see him. He's just gone under the bush. Let me just go forward a bit. Uh, Ephraim, are you and Andrew on CP still? Ah, uh, okay, copy guys. I think you're a bit, bit far. But I've got a pangolin on KNP boundary. Yeah, Ephraim, we just crossed the road now. So he's gone into that little thicket there and I'm just going to wait a little bit to see if he moves. We might not get another visual. He might be going in there for a snooze. And above him you can see a glossy starling. He also sometimes eats the ants. Specifically if that pangolin will dig open a nest and it'll go for the little ant larvae. But probably not a normal scenario because they are normally nocturnal coming out sort of after 10 o'clock at night but quite often if you see one in the area we now know where to look I can hear just hear him let me go forward a little bit moving through the undergrowth there Let's see if he's come out the other side no, he hasn't. I think he might be going for a little schnooze. But it's amazing how relaxed they are with vehicles and people. So they sort of know that we're not normally a threat. But of course, unfortunately, pangolin is one of the most threatened animals in the world. It's the most widely um, poached and traded uh, creature in the world at the moment. So they are safe in these areas. That inside the protected areas. Yeah, we can't see him now. We're just going to wait here. But uh, isn't that just super exciting? I got so excited I didn't even take a picture. Oh my goodness. Don't worry, I got it. No, we got it on video. Otherwise, no one would believe us. But isn't that amazing? And that's just to show you, you never know what we're going to see out here. Now, now we just need to find an art fog. And then we've got the sort of termite anteaters down. But I think he's snuck into that little thicket there. But it's definitely worth us waiting a lot around here for a little bit. I don't think we're going to see him for, for a while, but he might move out again. But that was... I think this, this is definitely going to make my top five ever safari live sightings. A pangolin! And what I will try to do, if we don't get another view of him, I will try to find some pugnacious ants, what he eats. So, very, very exciting. I'm still just checking to make sure he doesn't pop out the other side of that little thicket.
let's try and move forward a little bit. Can you see him in there, Dad? Mm. Maybe he's just just having a schnooze. I did hear some movement, but it is quite difficult with all this wind. But we definitely gonna have to come check around. Now, is that him or is that a stick? No, it's a stick. Um, Lynn's wondering, do they normally burrow into the ground? Uh, Lynn, they'll, they'll sleep under thickets, um, very similar to that. Um, they will sometimes go into, to, into burrows, but normally, normally in thickets. And um, that looks like a female. The males are probably double that size, but a pretty little girl. Now, I am really hoping that she moves out again and we can get another really good view of her. So, those scales are incredible. So, it's quite funny. If you ever, ever find one on foot, um, it sees you and gets a fright and rolls up and you tickle its back. You just run your finger down the middle of the spines like that. It sort of opens up, opens up, and then when you stop, it closes again. <laughs> it's very, very cute. Now, most of the pangolins I've seen in my life have actually been while following wild dogs, specifically after the pups start coming out um, of the den. They tend to find a lot of these little creatures. But I think, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure this is a first for Safari Live. Um, some of our long time viewers, let me know. Have you ever seen a pangolin before? Uh, I'll be very happy if you haven't. And I'm very happy that Dave and I were the ones, oh, what's that behind us? No, it's an impala. Got to show it to you. Um, very, very exciting. Sorry, a bit of a break up there, but I think Steve in, uh, in, in Montana was wondering whether it's the same as an armadillo, sort of. Uh, they're not, so it's a, it's a bit different to an armadillo. Uh, of, of course, also an anteater, but it's evolved separately. What, you, what sometimes would you call that similar evolutionary stuff is conspecific uh, cons, um, um, evolution. So they've evolved similar traits, even though they come from different ancestry. And then quickly opens up here. Yeah. Come on, come out and give us a good view. So there we go, we've got confirmation it is the first sighting ever of a pangolin on Safari Live. So, James Richard said, it's first pangolin, really exciting, can we see the track? Unfortunately, we can't. The ground is very hard here where it crossed. Um, so, and I've, I looked now, I can't see any other track. And also the light's really dull. So we need to find pangolin tracks in soft sand. And it's a really, not a lot's known about the sort of behavior and social organization of a pangolin and it's because they're nocturnal and they're very shy and very retiring and uh, of course you can't really walk around following them at night and one of the first actual studies done on pangolin with uh, radio transmitters and satellite transmitters was done in the southern Sabi sands um, so very very interesting so a lot of what we know about pangolins actually comes from this area but still there's so much unknown about them and it's what makes them one of the most interesting little creatures. Uh, Maggie in Australia is wondering why are, are pangolins so heavily poached? Is it for their meat? It's not Maggie, it's for their scales. Um, they're believed to be powerful love charms um, in a lot of African culture and Eastern culture. So that is why they are, are, are traded. And in Africa we've got quite a few different species. This is the ground or Temex pangolin. Uh, you've got giant pangolin and then you've got uh, long-tailed and tree pangolin. So there's about five, if I remember correctly, in total. Um, and I've only ever seen ground and uh, tree climbing. And I saw the tree climbing pangolins all live in Gabon, or in the, the Central African rainforests. And the giant pangolin also lives there. 
And the giant pangolin is actually a swimmer. These guys are actually not bad swimmers either. But the only giant pangolin I got to see was on one of our camera traps. I never actually got to see it in person. I'm pretty sure it's just sleeping in there. And we would have noticed if it snuck out the other side. Just look really carefully. So, well, Brent, what a great name. Brent in Ohio would like to know, how did I know it was a female pangolin? Uh, well, Brent, it was small. So male pangolin's about 50% bigger than that. So about double the size. Oh, there he goes. Gnormless Gnormans. Oh, he's, oh, he's gone. Sorry, Dave, I sold you down the river there. He disappeared out of sight. No, we're definitely not going to go look at the wildebeest just in case this uh, pangolin pops out of the bush. So, oh, we could, we might do, maybe let's just drive up and then we'll come back in a few minutes. So Daisy's wondering if there's one pangolin, does that mean there's a mate close by? Uh, not necessarily, as I said, a lot um, about pangolins are, is unknown. So I'm not 100% sure, uh, and, and no one really is, but we, we will uh, we'll try to get some research. I actually know the guy who did the study, so I'll try to get some information from him. There's a little stem bulky. Um, the pangolin we've just seen, oh, there's a little female stem bulk. Jeannie's wondering, do pangolins climb trees? Uh, not these ones. This is the ground pangolin. But there are two arboreal species of pangolin that live in the Central African rain or the Congo Basin rainforests. lovely little female stem book. I'm trying to see if I can spot the male. Uh, they do live in monogamous pairs. I'm, 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 I'm still sort of vibrating with excitement from that pangolin. Even though it wasn't the best pangolin sighting, I'm hoping we'll get another one just now. Yeah, there's the male wildebeest uh, who lives on the other clearing opposite Gnormanus Gnormans Viganu. Uh, we did give him a name, I can't remember it offhand now. Maybe this one should be Normal Norman. We've got Gnormanus Gnorman and we've got Normal Norman. Anyway, he's having a nice dust, little roll in the sand. Oh. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll just have a quick squeeze up to the top of the crest, see if we can find the tracks, and then we'll come back down uh, and see if we can get another visual of that pangolin. Lynn from Michigan. Lynn's wondering, does anything eat pangolins? Uh, people, mostly. Uh, hyenas and lions might play with them, chew on them a bit, but they never, I've never actually heard of them actually eating a pangolin. A hyena may be possible, but they, they curl themselves in such a tight little ball that it's near impossible for any of those to get in there.
So unfortunately, it seems like uh, Wendy and the bushwalk have gremlins. So uh, at the moment, there's just us. Uh, we will keep you updated on the progress. Tracks of an Ellie herd going back into the Kruger. getting chilly yeah, let's go back I can't help it I can't go that far away just in case the pangolin decides to move while we're away what we'll do we've got a nice hill get some momentum we'll switch off and we'll slide in quietly Dave, is that your first pangolin ever? That's quite right. There we yeah. go, Dave's Absolutely. first pangolin ever. Very first. Oh, you see Dave's, Dave's smiling. Those, those dimples of his are, are shining through. Just checking, we can see far to the water hole there. Just making sure there's nothing at the water hole. And there isn't. Old normal Norman's going to be wondering what, what we're up to. Stay away. Pretty confident it's still in that little thicket. Can't see anything, but you can see the clouds. And uh, just rolling in. It's very unusual to have clouds like this at this time of the year. And it is beautiful. Just going to take my binoculars and have a quick look. See if I can see any scales with my binoculars looking closely into the bush there. Can make it out. Um, it's definitely still there. I can just just made it out. I'm gonna try maybe go a bit forward. Okay, this is gonna be quite the difficult shot for Dave there. So zoom Dave and I'm going to direct you into where I could see it. Okay. So back side of that little fallen. So, um, a little bit to the left. Left. 
Okay, and I'll zoom a little bit to the right. There we go, no, sorry, to the left. Zoom to the right slightly. Zoom. It's just behind there, a little bit more to the right. A bit more to the right. Let's just have a quick look through there. Okay, keep going right. Oh, I just made out a scale in my binoculars. Think how you can see it. This is so incredibly frustrating. <laughs> ah, and it looks like Jamie's back. So while we wait for the pangolin to make another appearance, let's go see what she's up to. We're back, and can you believe it? The surprise and wonder at the fact that Brent had found a pangolin apparently was just too much for Wendy's signal, and we were doing so well that she promptly collapsed. But we are back once again, and we're with this gorgeous male kudu. Might not quite be a pangolin sighting, but the fact that we have a relaxed male kudu that's sticking around long enough for us to view him properly is actually quite rare in its own right. Oh, I'm so excited for Brent. I can only just imagine how bubbly he's feeling. I know exactly, I don't even, I can know, I know exactly what that feeling is like. It's that hot, almost metallic feeling of excitement when you see something as rare as that. I've only ever seen one pangolin in my entire life in the bush. He's incredibly lucky. I'm so glad he could share it with all of you. Sorry, Kudu, you are beautiful too, but you're sort of taking a back seat in my excitement about the pangolin. He's also disappearing off into relatively thick vegetation. Well, obviously our Arethusa plans have been scuppered for now. We shall not be attempting to follow up on Salaheshe or the Anderson Mail around some of their favorite areas. And instead we'll be exploring the western side of Juma. I'll take over where Brent left off in his search for the Queen of Juma, Karula the Leopard. And we'll see what else we can find. I think we need to find something really exciting, Vim. Should we get um, Artfark? So it's still not going to top a pangolin, though. I want a leopard. A le yes, okay. <laughs> Vim wants a leopard. We'll, look, we'll definitely look for a leopard. Always. I think we need... So, so far we've had a fantastic honey badger sighting just in the last two weeks. Fantastic honey badger sighting, a wildcat sighting. Brent, Steph, Graham and myself had a serval plus lion sighting, which is exceptionally rare. I love winter. It's totally worth feeling this cold just for the sightings like that. The last time I saw a pangolin in the wild, it was in a, on a day just like today and around a very similar time of year, moving about during the day. Oh, shivers, it's so exciting. And not just a perfect day for finding mysterious and rarer or nocturnal animals, but Gail, yes, absolutely, with this wind, even an animal like a lion that is usually resting up during the heat of the day could well be moving out and about, particularly lionesses. Now, lionesses t tend to be more active during the day than the males, just because they've got Quite, they're quite a few kilograms, and by quite a few, I mean a good 200 pounds-ish lighter than the males. And they don't overheat quite so quickly. And there is a good chance, Gail, that the predators would be using this as a time to be out and about. Leopards especially will be taking advantage of the climactic conditions. And that may actually be one of the reasons why Karula hasn't crossed back to the north. Now Brent said it was the impala that seemed to spark her interest and send her wandering off in that direction to the south of our boundary rather than coming to us in the north. 
So there's a chance that she did get lucky in that hunt and that that is where she is now resting to the south of our boundary with a very full belly which of course is exactly what we want to hear in terms of her well-being as well as her two cubs. It would be nice if she came across but you never know. And I think now what we'll do since the plans have changed ever so slightly is that we will go and see if there's been any movement from those lions that Fan told me about, that he saw the tracks going into the block between a Vubu and Gallego shortcut. The lions have also been giving us a little bit of, run of, of a run around over the last few days. We've been trying to find them. And they keep sort of dashing just beyond our reach. Usually we miss them by about 10 minutes. We don't quite just don't quite get to the boundary of our traversing area in time. That will have to change. But first, before we head across there, I think let's just check one more time that Karula really hasn't come across to in our direction. I'm dying to see her once again. <laughs> Playing hide and go seek around this bush with the male impala that was on the other side of it. It's not Nelson. The one-horned, one-eyed impala that we've all come to know. Oh, all of the animals seem to want to play peekaboo behind the trees. It must be particularly nerve-wracking on a day like today if you're a male impala. They've lost condition, almost all of the big rams like this. Oh, you can see how nervous he is. That has nothing to do with us. He's just so uncomfortable in this wind. An oc generally, a male impala is one of the best groomed antelopes of the lot. And John, apparently, recently you saw a, an impala that was exceptionally thin and tick infected, and you wanted to know why, since it was your understanding that ox peckers generally help to keep the tick population down. There's a couple of reasons that that could be. Most of the male impala now, while they're distracted by the rutting season, by the hormones, do lose condition very quickly. And as soon as an animal starts to lose condition, they start paying less attention to their appearance and most importantly to removing ticks. They don't bother as much. And ticks actually tend to take advantage of that. So an animal that's lost condition a little bit does have a higher tick count. It's one of the ways that ticks are actually involved within the ecosystem in terms of helping to remove a weak animal from circulation, so the genetics of a weak animal from circulation quickly. They weaken an already weak animal. With the male impalas, they're so distracted, they don't groom. When they finally get a harem for themselves, they don't tend to eat all that much. They don't spend that time ruminating, which means that they don't spend much time with their brain in that sleep-like state, and they just get thinner and thinner and thinner. And the oxpeckers do what they can, but they cannot help in a situation where an animal has lost as much condition. And it's particularly prevalent with male impalas right now. Generally, the teeth in the lower jaw, so the lower incisor teeth of an impala, are set quite loose in their sockets. And what that does is it forms a comb that allows the impala to groom through their fur very carefully. But a male impala, and they will also aloe groom, actually, just while I'm thinking of it, which is relatively rare in the antelope tribes. Not all that many antelope groom each other, but impala are one such antelope. They will do that. And, and then, of course, they are the smallest antelope that will allow oxpeckers to sit on their backs. 
but an ox picker can't really keep up with an animal that has become tick infested. You'll also see it with very weak thin buffalo. They'll have a higher tick count than normal and in fact any antelope that is ill and there's one calf recorded with four times, the, it was a wildebeest calf in this particular study, four times the normal amount or the average amount of ticks on it because it was ill it had a, it also had a broken leg and obviously some kind of secondary infection. Oh, the elephants have been doing some landscaping. They've taken out a black monkey orange. Oh, not monkey orange, sorry, black monkey thorn. Enjoying whatever vegetation they can get at present in terms of food. Now they play a very important role in controlling the tree layer of a, an area such as this, that's elephants that is, and by keeping an area relatively clean, free of trees, it's relative, and by making sure that it doesn't become overgrown, an elephant plays a crucial ro role because there's a very delicate balance between the grass and the tree layer, and if there's too many trees, the grass layers don't survive nearly as well. Andrew, you were wondering on the subject of what ecological benefit an elephant can have, whether or not they play any role in seed dispersal, and if whether or not there are specific trees. Here's our big group of kudu. The females of the group this time. Sorry, Andrew, I'll come back to you in a moment. Just watch our little kudu family. Tails all swishing disappear on their way to Treehouse Dam. Oh, and here, if you listen carefully over the sound of the wind, it might be tricky for you guys, but I can hear the buzzing of the ox pickers that John was talking about, sitting on the backs of the kudu, doing their job, keeping them clean and free of ticks. Sorry, Andrew, got completely distracted. Seed dispersal. Yes, there are trees. The biggest one that strings to mind immediately is that of the marula tree. Now, marula trees I spoke about at the start of our sunset safari. And we said that the fruit of the marula tree is incredibly nutritious, tastes really nice, as well as the fact that it's very, very high in vitamin C. And elephants absolutely love them. They will eat those, but because a digestive system, now we get back to the next section that we spoke about, which was an elephant's digestive system, and in fact I never finished chatting about because Brent found the pangolin and it was incredible, um, but we were talking about an elephant's digestive system being relatively inefficient in terms of the way it digests. That means that they excrete between a third and even up to a half of what they have eaten. Even this, oh, all the animals are so nervous at the moment. You can see he's injured his eye in some way. In that brief moment that we can see him, they, he might stop long enough for us. To, oh, he's covered in scars and scrapes around his face. Not difficult for us to conjecture how Nelson managed to use, lose his one eye, Nelson being the impala. Trying to re-time re our train of thought there. Andrew, the marula tree, very often when they've eaten it, they swallow it almost completely whole in some cases. What that means is that the seed of the marula fruit is excreted, defecated out, completely unharmed, unchewed and undigested, but now it finds itself in a homemade pile, elephant made, homemade is not really the right description, an elephant made pile of manure. It's basically like the perfect little pot plant that has its own nutrients for when it starts to grow. And that's why you'll very often see little marula trees sprouting out of elephant dung in the road at the right time of the year. That of course 
is provided that they avoid the attentions of the tree squirrels. Tree squirrels specially adapted to break open, pop open the marula fruit or the marula seed and get to the, the embryo inside the highest nutrient content of that particular seed, which is very, very rich in oil. Now the marula tree is one. The, there, there are other trees where the process will be relatively similar, a jackalberry, for example. But they tend to rely more, with their smaller seeds, or their smaller fruits, they tend to rely more on the smaller animals for dispersal. Things like monkeys and baboons that will come along and eat them, even jackal, since that is why the jackalberry has the name jackalberry, will eat their berries and then will go and defecate it out somewhere. In the case of monkeys and baboons, very often on the top of termite mounds. My goodness, it's a kudu themed segment. This is a magnificent kudu ball. At least I would guess six years old, judging by his horn growth. Much older than the, the bull that we started with earlier. Mm. Following the general trend of vanishing very quickly into the bushes. And a kudu is also something that will aid in seed dispersal. And again, as a browser, help to keep the tree layer, the woody layer, under control. A very good question there from Andrew about the seed dispersal mechanisms of the various plant species. Grass, of course, is far more, let me see if I can't find a good example here, because I know that we're all feeling it at the moment. Steph must be especially along with the cameramen who accompany him on bushwalks, and I've noticed it as well. And grass seeds, let's find a good example here somewhere. Grass seeds are also very well adapted towards the idea of dispersal through animals, but in a totally different way. So if I hop out here very quickly, oh. I'm going to get myself very caught up in a moment. Sorry, my cables have all switched around. Now let's take this grass, for example. Not the best example. I was looking for something like spear grass. But these seeds, when they are ready, will actually split open. And you can start to see it at the base of this one here. If we look here, can you see it there, VM, at the bottom? Starting to splinter off into different directions and these are very very sticky and they will catch on the legs and the fur of any of the passing animals that might move through. So a totally different method of dispersal. Eating as well is another method, maybe the rodents or the ants that might come through and husk them but generally they don't survive that sort of dispersal mechanism because the rodents and the ants are so good at actually getting to the real important part of the seed, which is the, the growing the budding plant as well as its food starch supply. It wasn't the best grass example, but I'm sure I could find plenty more. The reason I say that, or why I said that Steph is, would be experiencing that, is because if you are wandering through the bush at the moment, unless you have gaiters on, you know, those canvas protectors around your legs and your feet, you are going to be coming home with multiple species of grass attached to your sock and your trousers and wherever else they manage to get their spikes in. Here's an animal that plays, well at least not an animal, there's evidence of an animal that plays a very, very important role in seed dispersal. Another one we need to add to our list of wonderful nocturnal mystery sightings. There you go, that is a civet tree. And if we have a closer look in there, and actually be able to see there should be some guari berry seeds. I'm going to jump out and I'm going to show you 
Mostly, you've got the white exoskeletons. Sorry, Viam, just stand in front of your camera there. Um, mostly, we've got the white exoskeletons of the millipedes, but at the moment, there's not very mil many millipedes around. Now, if we look a little bit closer, and you'll have to forgive me because I'm quite reluctant to go and touch it, um, just because of what else a civet eats, which is all kinds of things, and they're, they're their feces was described to me by Mr. Hendry as smelling a bit like goat. And there we go. Exactly what I was looking for. Lots and lots. Okay, I've ended up touching it whether I want to or not. <laughs> lots of lots of guari berry seeds and other such things. And those having passed through the digestive tract of a civet, not like the coffee beans that people pay tremendous amounts of money for in other parts of the world. You can't make any coffee, as far as I know, out of guari berry seeds. But they've also come with their own, basically their own manure kit as they get ready to germinate. And the civet, even better for those particular seeds, is that the civet will come through and keep depositing in its civetry, in its little latrine, regularly, not necessarily every single night, but certainly you could see there, there were different, there was different feces of different ages. So those seeds have a good chance of germinating around there. James is spot on, that's exactly what it smells like. It smells like goat. I was trying to figure it out on the bushwalk one day and we were watching through it. We have meetings sort of twice a week where we discuss different things and he was absolutely correct. It smells like goat. All right, well, I don't know if Brent's managed to <laughs> top his pangolin sighting. I don't know if that is really possible to top its pangolin sighting, but let's see what else he's been up to. You can see the clouds are making for a beautiful sunset and you see how yellow the light is compared to what it's been over the last while and that's from that little bit of rain just settling the dust. So it was very difficult but Dave and I managed to do a big loop around all the open plains before going back to where the pangolin was. So fingers crossed, really hoping we can get a slightly better view. It was a really quick view. Uh, so. Fingers crossed, everyone! I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to drive past here every day for the next year now, just on the off chance that we see it again. Uh, but I have, in certain parts, depending, you can see pangolins regularly in the same area. So I've been looking for pugnacious ants, which is what a pangolin eats, and we haven't been down here yet. So the pangolin might have been feeding on these short grass areas where pugnacious ants are likely to occur. So for James Richard, I am trying to find a pangolin trap as well. Uh, but unfortunately, that little bit of rain has made the, the ground quite hard. Okay, Dave, what do you reckon? Let's have a look. Hi Ben, uh, Ben's 13 years old and Ben's wondering do pangolins have live babies or do they lay eggs? Well Ben, they are a mammal so they have live babies and uh, they are warm blooded. They, the keratin is what their scales are made out of which is the same as our hair or our fingernails so uh, that's how they develop that, it's a, a modification of hair. It's hair that's evolved to be armor plated. I'm literally looking under every bush. But I can't take the, all the credit there. Dave is the one who spotted it. There we go. He says, what is that? Look at the pangolin! Quickly, final control! And you know, I think... I've driven the Kruger boundary a lot of times. It's the first actual sort of really exciting sighting we've had on the boundary. We've had tracks and we've had lots of other things. 
but no actual live animals. I mean, we've had wildebeest, kumpala, buffalo. I think we've had elephant, but, but never something as exciting as a pangolin. So they can roll into this incredible ball uh, and it probably gets about this big. And that's their defense mechanism. And, and the edges of those scales are really sharp. I mean, they can cut you if you try and pick them up or move them around. Yeah, we're in pangolin country there. Looking left, looking right, looking left, looking right. Uh, it could have moved. Uh, it's, all this area is, is really good for it to feed. Um, those particular ants are very fond of open ground. They are quite terrible creatures. They're called pugnacious ants. The obvious reason that they are very pugnacious and they tend to maul you. So he was around here. Just to check. You never know, he might have come back. He might have gone that way. I'm not seeing anything though. I mean, that, the, the timing was just so incredibly lucky. There's no other way to describe it. We, we have all the luck today. I mean, Karula this morning, pangolin this evening. Who knows, maybe there's another pangolin around. We could, I mean, we've got one. We might as well, well, well try to spoil ourselves with two. I'm not seeing it. It doesn't look like it was where it was. But what we can do is I'm just going to pull off the road here quickly and I'll show you some images of the pangolin. Disappearing pangolin. Okay, so it wasn't the best view. We did just sort of see the tail end as they disappeared. And there, I was telling you about how they roll into a defensive ball. That's not the best picture. It's a little bit pixelated, but there we go. You can see there's the defensive posture. And um, there's a closer look at the scales. And the foot. Now look at those claws. And they use that to dig out the ants. And, and there goes the picture. There's a bit of picture somewhere here. Um, oh, it's a very old picture from 1910 in Tanzania. And there we go. It's quite difficult to get good pictures of them. I mean, they're very strange looking little creatures. So there we go. And this one is the ground pangolin, or the Temex pangolin is the old name. Um, as I said, they are on the threatened list uh, due to, to trade in the scales for love charms. Um, and there was actually, I was having a quick look there, there was something else. And they were, uh, that they were used for, uh, and the meat is uh, is also uh, a delicacy in Vietnam and and, and China. Uh, the blood is believed to be a healing tonic, and fetuses are uh, have alleged health and aphrodisiac properties. Very scary, and, but very very sad. Fortunately, the in this part of the world they are quite well protected and there isn't too much trade uh, in other parts of africa especially in the, in the forest basin those the, the pangolins they are under a lot lot bigger threat than our pangolins here but i wish we could show you more but unfortunately that pangolin has done a disappearing act and if you've got any screenshots of that pangolin pop them up on our facebook page and twitter 
and hashtag Safari Live. And if any of you are new and wondering about and want to know anything specific about the pangolin, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And uh, for anyone who's new and just joined, my name is Brent Leo Smith and I'm your safari guide out in the live African, or in the African bush and we are live. And my cameraman is Dave. And we're on top of the world because we found the first pangolin ever on Safari Live. I'm quite sure Commander Bond, James Henry, is muttering away to himself on the beach somewhere. I won't lie. A may or may, or may not have already sent him a, 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 a picture of it. <laughs> So, uh, James Richard was looking for tracks. Unfortunately, there's hard ground. I haven't been able to find any tracks, James. I still half expect to see the little guy scurrying along. We might do one more loop. Just one more. Uh, so, while we throw caution to the wind and do uh, one last loop for Pangolin, uh, let's go see what Jamie's up to. In the hope that that one last loop will pay off while he goes searching for that pangolin once again, we're going to go and do one last loop around Mvubu and Galago, see if the lions have not decided to come out. From what I can hear from the update that, about those tracks, it was a male and a female, so probably a mating pair quite possibly, well most likely, one of the Birmingham boys and one of the Inkuhumas. So the pride of lionesses, that is, that this is part of their territory, and then the Birmingham boys that are dominant over them in the Styx pride, and possibly even other prides that we are not aware of. Uh, we're going to head across in that direction and see whether or not they've decided to pop out there. We'll go past the Vuyatela Dam, so the one outside Galago, just to investigate whether or not there's any sign of them coming for a drink. I think, however, it's most likely that they would go through to that Galago pan. Now, within that block, there's a network of drainage lines that crisscross all the way through. And that's one of their absolute favorite places to hang out. And in fact, I was secretly hoping that that pregnant Mkuhuma lioness might decide to have her cubs there. It's the perfect hiding spot. It's a place where Karula very often apparently liked to have her cubs. And there was some very playful banter on the Game Drive channel while you were with Brent about the age of those particular tracks. We were talking about the rain and how they help to age tracks. Well, there was a disagreement between two of the guides as to exactly how old those tracks were with one exclaiming that the tracks were so old that those lions could be in Skukuza, which is the main camp in the Kruger National Park and is probably about, I don't know, about 40 kilometers away in a straight line, 20, just under 20 odd miles. With the, whilst the other protesting that this was not in fact the case and that those tracks were fresh from after the rain. There was a great deal of chuckling and bantering going forth. And these are the boys that one wants to look out for in weather like this. First of all, they are exhibiting all of the signs of nervousness on a windy day. But they're also very difficult to hear. That, oh, <laughs> pushing through, disrupting the drongo and waddling off. Uh, typically, you, you generally hear buffalo bulls before you see them. You can Sometimes you can smell them, but it's the ox pickers that give them away. But as I said, on these windy days, not always that easy. And as we come through in this beautiful off sort of evening light, you've got more zebra. We're not going to linger for too long with them, I don't think. We'll see if we can't get to where those lion tracks last were before we lose too much light. Two little ones. Uh, 
the second herd obviously is split away from the herd we saw at Impala Plains. They're having a good snuffle around. The one on the left looks particularly ro round, rotund, even for a zebra. And I suspect that might be, in fact I'm relatively certain, that's due to pregnancy, just from the way that she's waddling along. I say even for a zebra, of course, because all zebra have round barrel-like bellies. Yeah, I said we're not going to linger for too long. It's just because I want to get to... It's the perfect time if there are lions hiding out and about. Oh, my goodness. Try and get my hair under control. It's the perfect time of day on a chilly evening, windy evening, for them to be wandering about. Oh, but we are going to stop for some animals that are truly not appreciating this weather. <laughs> Torf mongoose feeling very cold and sorry for themselves. And it's almost bedtime. Most of them dashing for the safety of their termite mound burrow. Yep. Today is definitely not a day to linger outside. The antenna. <laughs> That's incredible. I don't know. I don't know if you could hear that or not. But the antenna of our vehicle, I think, is acting like a wind flute. And as the wind blows across it, just like you do with a bottle, when you blow across the bottle and it makes those noises, we've got it at exactly the right angle that it's blowing gently. Can you hear that? It's making music. <laughs> it's gently whistling to us. Maybe it's making a, a magic call to attract leopards. Maybe we should sit in this position and wait for it to call them to us. It feels like some kind of mystical sound, mystical tune that Wendy's playing. Maybe it's an anti-Gremlin song. That's interesting. That's a first for me. Must have been exactly the right angle that we parked at. Playing us musical tunes to accompany the evening. Wow. Wendy is now singing to us. I do have to wonder whether or not this is going to mean more rain or if it's just the tail end of the cold front. Oh, everybody, hold on to your seats. Humpy bumpy. Oh, no, no, Wendy. Up we go. There we have another one of the trees we were talking about earlier as we slowly go underneath this gorgeous jackalberry tree. We chatted about its seed dispersal methods earlier. And maybe with those baboon troops around, we might be seeing more and more of them hanging about close. That would be a perfect place for a baboon to hide. There's a little antelope in there that we hardly ever get to see, just poking its head out. Can you see the bush buffalovium hiding in that drainage line, just on the wall? There it is. It maybe a little bit down to the left. I'm just trying to see from your perspective. Oh, you got him. There you go. This is for James Richard, who was asking about bushbuck or asking to see bushbuck. There you go. Hands down, I think, my favorite antelope in this area. They are just such gorgeous little things. 
Veeam had a couple living outside his bedroom at one point. Are they still there, Veeam? They no, still come back. Oh, there's elephants living there now. Ah, they've chased the bushbuck away. Uh, a little bushbuck female with that beautiful pattern of dots, almost like a constellation of stars on their fur, and that rich ochre colour of their fur around them. Very pretty, very delicate little antelope, and just the hint of the stripes that sort of are a throwback to at the time when Bushbuck, Nyala and Kudu had common ancestors. Lovely. Well, James Richard, I hope you were watching and that you got your little Bushbuck sighting. Another antelope that will spend a lot of time in these drainage lines or river systems, basically like a creek system, and feed on the fruits and the berries and whatever else happens to be around them. Now, Sabrina, we were talking about seed distribution or seed dispersal, and you were wondering if there are any animal that might disperse seeds with their feet. And yes, absolutely. So Brent was showing you or he, um, Sabrina, I'm not sure if you were watching yesterday's sunset safari, but in, the, in Brent's brief wonder about quarantine, he was talking about a plant called a devil thorn. It's got two very, very sharp prongs. There's a large devil thorn and a smaller devil thorn. They've got very, very sharp prongs. And every South African child is most familiar with the devil thorn, as well as little plants called devil peas, little devils. And they, ha they are specifically adapted for dispersal on an animal's foot. Even an elephant's okay. foot is not impervious to them. And the reason be is that they don't necessarily pierce the skin of the elephant, but they're sharp enough to just get into that first layer of skin cells. Well, for us, it's a different story because they are sharp enough to pierce the few layers of skin on our feet. And you it will all, every South African child has memories of sitting, plucking devil keys out of your feet and trying to scrape them out when they're left little bits behind. But those are types of plants that are adapted to be stood on and then dispersed in that method. Now another clever little method plants have come up with. I'll never ever forget the face of one incredulous volunteer when we took him out to help us clear the roads once and he was just incredibly surprised and somewhat personally affronted that every tree in South Africa seemed to have thorns. He was most upset. Of course, there's a whole wide range of ad adaptations or adaptions um, that the plants have to utilize in response to being fed upon. And yet they don't work. Maybe they do in terms of deterring some of the smaller species of antelope, but a, a buffalo thorn, a sickle bush, anything with those really spiky, horrible thorns and knob thorn. We've spoken so much about the fact that a giraffe or an elephant doesn't seem to even notice the fact that what they're eating has thorns or spines or anything of the sort. We're going to search for the tawny cats that are hiding somewhere in this block. In the meantime, in continuation of the theme of this sunset safari, Brent has found you another elephant. Found a small breeding herd of Ellie's. And it looks like that same unrelaxed bull we saw a little bit earlier at the pan and another bigger bull just behind him. I have joined up with this little breeding herd. There could be some more in the bush that we're not seeing. But they're slowly moving out into this big open area. And it looks very much like the bull we saw a bit earlier.
Chikra from India is wondering how do you read an elephant's body language? Um, well, with African elephants, a lot of it is just, I suppose, a lot of it's instinct and time spent with the animals. So there's slight little things. You just see their mu muscles stiffen. The tail is a very good indicator. If the tail becomes rigid or pointed, uh, it means the animal is upset or highly alert. So you can see we've stopped quite far away from these eddies. And you can see the tails are hanging loosely. And they are in no means worried about us. Feeding off a baby leadwood there. Hi, Gracie. Uh, uh, Gracie said she had a sad dream about the eddies last night and cried a lot. So she's very happy to see them today, to see that they're okay. And you can see Gracie, there's the little one. He's happy. Maybe he's a bit cold in this wind, but you can see the eddies are all fine and all good. Uh, we won't go any closer in this wind, they can be a little bit unpredictable. At the moment this herd looks very relaxed, but still. They also are mobile north across uh, into Incoral, but we will stay with them as long as we can. There's that young bull, I'm pretty sure he looks like the same bull we saw at the pan earlier. And he's probably a lot more relaxed this time um, because we've come from downwind, so he's heard us coming. I think the reason he got a fright when we arrived at the pan last time is we were coming from upwind of him and the wind's very strong, so he probably didn't hear us arriving. Hello, little one. even though it's still very much reliant on mom's milk already feeding on vegetable matter and you can see this young bull It'll be interesting to see what happens here when he feeds or decides to annoy the breeding herd it looked like he might annoy them a bit earlier but i think he's more focused on getting a good meal I don't know if you guys can hear that wind buffeting. Really cold wind coming from the south. Oh, they're gonna disappear shortly. Heading slowly north. We're going to leave those ellies as they move further into Encoral. And I just want to have a quick check along the northern edge of Cheetah Plains. Maybe Mr. Q is going to pop in for a visit. I'm still, still. So excited about that pangolin. Hopefully we can get a better view in the coming winter months. So 
So this is the area quarantines have been moving in and out of. Well, hi Aaron. Uh, Aaron wants to know if I have one great single memory that stands out for my years in the bush. Definitely not one, but thousands, Aaron. But I think probably the most poignant memory and probably the one that set me on the course uh, I've been on most of my life is, is my first memory. I thought I saw something on top of that termite pile. Yep. Uh, and it is my, my first, first memory. I was about two years old and we were up in northern Botswana and my parents, grandparents and friends of theirs were had stopped at a waterhole in I think it was either Chobe, I think it was Chobe or Maremi National Park in the vast Mapani forest. And uh, me being me, turn your back for two seconds and I'm gone at that edge. And they sort of turned around and they'd stopped and there was a big elephant bull, a massive elephant bull, uh, having a drink at the pan. And my dad turned around and noticed there, there I was about four meters from the elephant having a conversation in gibberish of course at the elephant wow, 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 wow. and i just remember that elephant uh, and it's probably because i got a hiding afterwards <laughs> so my dad managed to walk very calmly up to this big bull elephant pick up his two-year-old child and walk away the eddie didn't do anything i got i got i got a smack for being naughty and uh that that's probably my that's my first memory and it probably has a lot to do with um <laughs> where, I, where and how I've ended up now and what I've done over the last however many years in the bush. I always have a soft spot for those big heavy bulls. Um, and even as an adult I've had many conversations on foot with elephants since. Ooh, I think it's time, Dad. It's time. It's time for the gloves. <laughs> it is bitterly cold this evening, but who cares? We saw pangolin. <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be much jealousy back at camp. Dave, I think we should maybe walk out a pangolin dance. We dance into. We dance back into the camp. That sounds about right. Yeah. So, we are now still on a high from the pangolin, of course, but now we're hoping for a bit of leopard luck. And we just keep missing quarantine when he's in this area. I'm hoping this evening will be a bit different. But is that, even though it's really cold, and it's still very beautiful out yet. But it's on, on, on days like this, uh, it reminds me of an Ernest Hemingway quote. And Hemingway is one of my favorite authors. And he says, I never knew a day in Africa that I wasn't happy. Now that's an incredible thing for a deeply troubled man. He was a deeply troubled man, Mr. Hemingway. Looking at every bush, I, I'm convinced we've got to we've got to work this lucky streak. Maybe add a serval, a honey badger, a porcupine. Who knows? I think Art Fox, the next big one.
but I, oh, I still, I'm still, still almost speechless from that pangolin. So while I regain my voice, uh, let's jump back on board with Jamie. I hear that, I hear Brent is planning a pangolin waltz. A pangolin waltz when he comes back into camp. Now I hear that waltzes are really bad for bad hips. So maybe better tone down his dancing style ever so slightly. <laughs> Although I have to say I'd like to see what a pangolin waltz really does look like. Oh, well Brent plans his dance steps, um, which could be very highly entertaining. I'll try and record it for you all so you get to see it. We've been searching high and low for these lions. No sign of them here. There's a big herd of elephants hanging about. They are right in the middle of the block, so we can't see them. But there's always a chance that they could flush out a mating pair of lions. In the meantime, we're going to take advantage. We're going to drive a little bit further. We're going to take advantage of the last few moments of light and see if the hyenas aren't home. I haven't seen them in a while now. And if we can't depend on the leopards and the lions to be in one place, well, fingers crossed, our hyenas will be kind to us this afternoon. Oh, we're racing the sunset here, though. I don't want to go too fast in case I miss lion tracks popping out. And then, of course, we've still got the darkness to look forward to, and who knows, we could waltz in doing a, a caracal dance or an art park dance. Might not be quite a pangolin dance, but it will certainly come in in a very close second. Viv <laughs> says he'll settle for a leopard dance. I'll find you a leopard at some point, Viv, I promise. <laughs> they've, been, they've been shy recently, very camera shy. I feel like I haven't seen Tingana, the dominant male in this area, for a very long time. Oh, this wind is cutting through several layers of jackets. Absolutely freezing. All right, first hyena den? Nope. Luckily, we can see this one from the road. Doesn't look like there's anybody home. We can't linger. We have to race light. And then we'll go back again to where the lions were and see if we can't find them there as it gets dark. Frankens are calling very, very close to the hyena den. That's interesting. Our Franklin have a very close association with predator den sites, particularly those of wild dog, but the same could be said for hyena as well. And what they'll do is they'll hang around and actually pick up and tidy up the scraps, because although a Franklin is a seed-eating bird, it is not above picking up scraps of meat and bone as well to supplement its diet. And there's some wonderful pictures available if you want to go searching of wild dog puppies and Franklins in very close proximity to each other. Mmm, it's not looking... It doesn't look like anybody's home. interesting question about from Leo in Washington and giving me a little bit of background interesting background into stuff that happens or the legality in the US of keeping bird feathers and apparently only Native Americans can keep the feathers of eagles and she was wondering whether or not there are any laws in South Africa to prevent the shooting of birds or the collecting of feathers ah there is somebody home goodness completely hidden there. Hello, who have we got here? 
Lael, let me just finish off your question before we start chatting about the hyena. And, oops, I have to take my foot off the brake. Um, Lael, there are protected bird species. The endangered species are protected by law. I'm sorry.